Alright, we have natural disasters. I'm Brooke. I'm Bailey. Dakota. <laughs> um, we chose natural disasters because originally we were going to do volcanoes, but then we found out there was like nothing to research on volcanoes. So um, we were focusing on Dante's Peak and then began talking about other movies that we enjoyed and had in other large natural events. And this brought us to the topic of natural disasters because we wanted to incorporate multiple natural occurring events, not just volcanoes. We're starting with Pompeii. Um, the movie was directed and co-written by Paul W.S. Anderson, and he aimed for the most scientifically accurate depiction of the eruption yet, and he succeeded in that. Um, after searching for scripts, Anderson found a draft and finished it after five years, and while he was writing it and filming it, he called in scientific and historic advisors to make sure that everything was as accurate as possible. Ooh. crater's volume with the one-third pi r squared times height, and we got to be 429,504,791 meters cubed. And then to find the volume of the, the whole volcano of Vesuvius, we used the Freshman equation, pi r squared plus little r, big r, big r squared h over 3, and the little r was 350 meters, which is the radius of Grand Pono, and then the big r, we did two pi equal to the, 2 pi r equal to the circumference of the base, and we got 3,073.616 meters. And so the volume of Vesuvius with the Grand Kono is 1.428 times 10 to the 10th meters cubed, but then without including Grand Kono, it is 1.385 times 10 to the 10th meter cubed. So for the history of Preston, um the Frustum Square Pyramid was first introduced by ancient Egyptian mathematics around 15, or 1850 BC. And the equation for the Frustum Square py uh, Pyramid is volume equals one third height times the quantity of A squared plus A times B plus B squared. And then the Frustum Circular Cone Pyramid is volume equals pi times height times the quantity of R1 squared plus R1 times R2 plus R2 squared all over. Okay, so then we wanted to see if anyone in Pompeii could survive if they were running away from the pyroclastic flow. And we found that an average person can run a mile in 7 to 10 minutes. So we have three runners, runner A, B, and C. Runner A is running at 7 minutes, runner B is running a mile in 7 minutes, runner B is doing a mile in 8.5 minutes, and runner C is doing a mile in 10 minutes. And then we just use a conversion one mile over 7 minutes times 60 minutes over one hour to get 8.572 miles per hour or 3.83 meters per second. And they use the same per conversion for B and C, just interplaced the seven minutes with the 8.5 and 10, to get 7.06 miles per hour or 3.156 meters per second for runner B, and then six miles per hour or 2.68 meters per second for runner C. And then below that, the 40, we have an equation which is 44.4, which is the speed of the pyroclastic flow times x of time 
equals the runner speed plus 8,000, which is the distance of Pompeii from Vesuvius. And so runner A will die in 3.25 minutes or 195 seconds. Runner B will die at what, in 193.97 seconds or 3.233 minutes. And then runner C will die in 3.196 minutes or 191.75 <laughs> seconds. And then we wanted to see if Usain Bolt, the fastest runner, could survive. He can't. He died at 250.92 seconds or 4.182 minutes. So we last another minute, but um, not much longer. So we decided we also wanted to find how fast someone would have to run to escape the pyroclastic flow. And pyroclastic flows, their speed changes throughout the run, but they usually stop at about 15 15,000 meters or 15 kilometers away from where it started. So we took the, we found the intersection by placing, um, never mind, okay. So on our calculators, we found the intersection between the uh, y equals 15, uh, 100, 15,000 and the equation of the pyroclastic flow. And so we found the time that someone, that pyroclastic flow hits the 15, thousand meter mark would be 337.84 seconds and so we put that in and to find the slope the slope of the line that which would be the speed that someone would have to run to get away from Vesuvius and pyroclastic flow and we found that to be 20.72 meters per second which no one can run it fast so if you're accomplishing that happens yes so next, we're focusing on the movie Twister. Um, the history of Twister uh, is directed by Jan de Bont, and it was made as an action-packed element, partly focusing on any actual facts. And many situations were more than coincidental to keep the plot moving. And Twister was nominated for Best Visual Effects, but won the award for Worst Screenplay for a film grossing over $100 million. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we wanted to find the velocity of the tornado, and in the movie it said that the tornado was a mile wide, or 1,609.2 meters, so 0.5 mile radius, and in the, one of the last scenes, Bill and Joe are in like this little shed shack thing, and it takes 57.016 seconds for the tornado to pass over, so we took the the distance of the width of the tornado, divided by the seconds to get it was moving at 28.226 meters per second or 63.14 miles per hour. Yes, they should have been killed. 
<laughs> Why? Because it can pick up a semi truck. It can pick up that little tiny ram truck. <laughs> anyway, so the mass of the truck without the gas inside it would be about 12,000 kilograms. And we found that the average amount of gas that is in a uh, tanker truck is about 9,000 liters. So when we convert that, it comes to about 6,578.4 kilograms. And that gives us a total mass of the truck and the gas at 18,578.4 kilograms. So we found out the force needed to lift the truck into the air, which is by taking the mass of the truck times the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. And we found that the force needed to lift the truck is 182,068.32 newtons. And so our distance that the truck traveled through the air was really based off of Dakota, because it never really shows us what speed the truck is moving as it's um, going away from the tornado and into the flaming uh, truck. So we asked Dakota, hmm, how fast is that truck going? And she'd be like, well, if I were in their seats, I would push the gas pedal down as far as it went, and that's how fast it was going. It's like, thanks, Dakota, that's very helpful. <laughs> so we decided it was around the top speed of, what was it, 100? Yeah. 100 miles per hour. And we timed out the amount of time, that we timed how long it took for the truck from when it hit and was really moving over them to the time it hit the ground. And since the truck was a little bit ahead and the truck land, the semi truck was a little bit ahead and the semi truck landed a little bit ahead, we assumed that the distances were about the same. So we got it at about 402.336 meters. And so we wanted to find the amount of work that the tornado needed to do to actually lift uh, the truck that far. So we took the distance that it traveled times the amount of force needed to lift it and found that the grand total of work was 73,252,639.6 joules of work. And so we wanted to see if the tornado's wind speed would actually be able to pick up that, so we found the equation of velocity equals the square root of two times energy divided by mass. And so when we put all our numbers into that, we found that the wind speed needed to pick up the truck would be 88.802 meters per second, which is around 198.64 miles per hour. And while this seems extremely fast, a F5 tornado, as it was um, said earlier in the movie, can get speeds up to 101 to, ah, sorry, 301 to 318 miles per hour. So yes, it can pick up the tanker truck. It can also pick up the tiny truck they were in. So they should have been killed. For the history of velocity, it was discovered by Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, both in the 1600s, and they both discovered the fundamental theorem of calculus, and they both found that the relation of position, velocity, and acceleration to be derivatives of each other. And then our third movie is The Day After Tomorrow. It might be, sorry. <laughs> Um, the history of the tomorrow is it was directed by Roland Emmerich and it repeats this pattern of featuring the strength of humanity in life or death situations. He also directed Godzilla and Independence Day. This movie was based off the theory that raising global temperatures could result in a major global global cooling. And he also had strong opinions when it came to environment and strongly disliked President George W. Bush, so he did not portray the vice president in this movie to be very
tsunami occurred. And from the shoreline, when the video started, to the library, where it ended, is 4.1 miles, or 6,598.31 meters. And in the movie, it took 2 minutes, 13.114 seconds, or 133.114 seconds from the shoreline to the library. And we found that the high speed of a tsunami is 222.2 meters per second. On average, it's 200 meters per second. So we took the distance from the sea to the sea, like shoreline to the library and divided by 200 meters to get meters per second to get 32.992 seconds. And then we took 6,598.31 meters divided by 222.22 meters per second to get 29.693 seconds, which is very, very, almost a fourth of what they had for time. So they would be dead. So, we wanted to find out how fast the tsunami would be moving, or would have to be moving for them to survive that time. So we took the distance from the sea to the library and divided by the amount of time that the sea took, which is 133.114 seconds, and found that the tsunami would have to be moving at 49.469 meters per second, which is about 110.883 miles per hour, which is about half the average speed. So later in the movie, there is a gigantic blizzard, an uh, ice storm of death, you know, freezing very quickly. So we decided that it's already snowing there, so the temperature has to be at least 32 degrees or lower. So we're deciding, hey, <coughs> might as well give the protagonist a chance at living. So we're going to have it at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So and earlier, right before the storm hits Manhattan, they say that it is dropping at 10 degrees per second. So we found that we came up with an equation that said the temperature equals 30 minus 10x, where x is time. And so from the start of the main freeze, where Manhattan really begins to start turning into ice, to the door in the library where they shut it and you know it's a nice warm room, it takes about 115.124 seconds. And so by plugging that into the equation, we can find that the temperature would be around negative 1,121.24 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, and then just a few seconds later, the scene ends. So we found out that by plugging in the time it took for the entire scene to go on, which is 133.66 seconds, we found that the temperature would be negative 1,306.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So we wanted to see how much this would affect people in the room. So we took the um, negative 1,306.6 and subtracted it from the um, 1,121.24 degrees and found that the change in temperature should be around negative 185.36 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we decided that we want to find the final temperature in the room at the time that the scene ends. And we're deciding that it's around room temperature, which obviously it wouldn't because they have a bunch of winter coats on. So, but we added 70 degrees onto our answer above to get a negative 115.36 degrees as a final temperature, which is close to Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> and they have light winter jackets on. Yeah. So, before the tsunami, there is another time when the storm ends up freezing a bunch of stuff. And that is when the royal family is being evacuated from. Buckingham Palace by the Royal Air Force. Well, inside the eye of the storm, it takes about 24.211 seconds for the fuel lines to freeze. And so we plugged that into our original equation and found that it was that the temperature of that gas freezes is negative 212.11 degrees Fahrenheit. But later in the movie, and we found out ourselves online, that gasoline is, and helicopter fuel freezes at negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So that meant, meant either our timing was wrong, which could have been, of course. But that also could mean that the rate of freezing is wrong, and that would make sense because the storm is not as powerful because it's only just started freezing and getting a lot of power from the global warming and the um, ice sheet melting. So by our freezing rate, it should have taken about 18 seconds to um, freeze the gasoline. And we found that by just setting our original equation of 30 minus 10x equals to negative 150 and found that it took about 18 seconds, or would have taken. And so we wanted to find our new freezing rate. So 
we t did the exact same thing except we got rid of the freezing rate and added our time times whatever the rate would be. And we found that the freezing rate of this storm that is over Scotland is negative 7.435 degrees Fahrenheit per second. So not as powerful as the one that hit Manhattan. All right. Thank you.